Getting a job is hard. Let's save the world instead. Can you beat Final Fantasy V without jobs or armor? Hey there guys, November Joy here, and welcome to the Reptile Rumble. Out of the entire Final Fantasy series, V has a special place in my heart for embracing how goofy its plot is while managing to keep a serious tone, and for its incredibly balanced gameplay. This might be one of the most well-balanced games I've ever seen, considering how almost every single class has some viable combat options. But, what if we push these incredibly well-balanced systems to their breaking point by refusing to use any of them? Can you beat Final Fantasy V without jobs or armor? Let's break down the rules. I'm not allowed to use any jobs at any point. Everyone must remain as the default freelancer class, and I can't swap them, even for out-of-battle uses. This means nobody will ever learn any abilities, and I'll only be using the fight and item commands throughout the entire game. I'm also not allowed to wear any armor. Weapons are fair game, but shields and anything worn in any other slot is prohibited, which means I'll have literally zero defense against everything. As for optional challenges, I'm going to avoid breaking rods unless I can't progress without doing so, since breaking rods also breaks the game. And I'll also try to complete every optional boss I can. I know I can't beat all of them, but what would be the fun if I didn't try? Now, without further ado, let's jump into the run. The opening parts of the game don't change much. We give our main character a very fitting name, and run straight through the first two areas of the game. We aren't supposed to have jobs yet, so the only thing that changes is that I have to remember to take everyone's armor off. Let's summarize it. We get captured by pirates, assemble our full party, murder a bird, then get blessed by the crystal's essences. Too bad we're not using them in this challenge. Since we have no use for armor or magic, we'll instead spend that money on healing items before we head to the Torna Canal. I won't talk too much about individual dungeons or random encounters unless they're particularly noteworthy. Just know that the random encounters take longer and hit much harder due to our poor offense and literally non-existent defense. It's smooth sailing until Carlobos uses Whirlpool and forces us into a fight with him. We don't do much damage to Carlobos, but he doesn't do much damage to us either, so eventually we manage to win. Our Gyarados was trapped by the Whirlpool though, so we end up in the ship graveyard. Along the way, we discover that the guy with long flowing hair and massive pecs wasn't a guy after all. Siren is our next boss, and she's a bit of a weird one. When she's in her normal form, she can't do much against us. When she's in her undead form, though, she can almost one-shot anyone in my party, and her defense goes up by a ton. However, being undead also comes with a weakness to healing items, so we can just chuck potions at her face instead. I lost Galuf and Ferris, but it was still a first-try victory. In Carwin, we make sure to grab longswords while we stock up on potions. They're not a huge upgrade, but any damage increase is a good one. Turns out there's a Windrake on North Mountain, so it looks like that's where we're heading. The only special thing about this place is Poisonous Flowers, which, of course, I ended up stepping on. It's all fun and games until Lana falls for Princess Bait and gets shot with poison, leading us into a fight with Magissa. Her magic isn't a huge problem. What is a problem is her husband, Forza, who she calls in after taking a certain amount of damage. Sadly, he is not a car, but he does deal immense physical damage. Anyone not at full HP gets wiped out by his regular attack, and his special knocks anyone down instantly. I didn't survive much longer after that. The second attempt actually went worse, because Magissa used Drain. It deals about 200 damage to one target and heals her for the same amount, which is more than enough to take any party member down. I tried again, but it was clear that this just wasn't happening yet. I don't have any tools to work with this early in the game, either, so there's not much to do except grind a couple levels. Two levels make a lot of difference this early in the game. We actually managed to take down Forza, before Magissa finishes us off. On the next attempt though, Magissa was feeling more merciful than usual, so I was able to get back up on my feet. That was surprisingly nice of her. I still stabbed her, but it was nice all the same. Afterwards, Lena proceeds to get super poisoned by walking all over the evil flowers. Here you, the Windrake, manages to cure her with... I don't know, magic Windrake powers? They never really explain this part. Anyway, now that we have a Windrake to ride on, we'll go in the exact opposite direction the plot wants us to, and go back to Tycoon instead. 
Now, why would we want to head back there? First of all, because there's a nice cutscene between Lena and Ferris, and secondly, there's a nice storehouse full of nice gear. We can't ever use the Shuriken because it has to be thrown, but we can make use of the Healing Staff, Diamond Bell, and Ashura. Now, normally this stuff is made for jobs that we don't have yet, but because we have no jobs, we can use whatever we want. Since Magissa also dropped a whip after we defeated her, now we can finally strategize with our equipment selection. Being in the back row cuts the physical damage you deal by about half, but also cuts the physical damage you receive by half. However, ranged weapons like whips and bells do full damage from the back row, so Hikiko and Galuf will make full use of them. Then, we can have Lena using the healing staff from the back to keep everyone healed up, and Ferris in the front with the Ashura to deal the most damage. This should be more than enough to get us through the next section of the game. Let's move on with the plot. There's not much to do in Waltz besides maxing out our stock of potions. Turns out, they're doing alright. Oh wait, here comes a wild meteor. Guess they're not so alright after all. Our next destination is their water tower. I actually underestimated how useful the healing staff would be. I barely used any healing items at all because the staff was so effective at keeping everyone healthy while I made my way up. Garul is our next major fight, and it was a lot easier than the last one. All he does is physical attacks, and those are a lot less threatening when most of our party is in the back row and we have the healing staff to fully restore HP. He did manage to take down one of my party members with counterattacks, but I easily recovered and beat him down after that. We get a few more pieces of useless crystal jewelry afterwards, and Sildra shows up to save everyone when the tower sinks. Being serious for the moment, maybe it's the nostalgia talking, but I'm surprised how much I felt from this scene considering it's a sea dragon with no dialogue and only two sound effects. Let's just move on to Karnak, where we immediately get arrested upon trying to buy something. What, did I forget to pay the tax or something? Getting arrested might not be so bad though, since we managed to meet up with this game's incarnation of Sid. The next dungeon we're heading to is the fire-powered ship. It's a bit more complicated than previous dungeons, but nothing we can't handle. After we pick up a Moonring Blade, which is an upgrade to our back row weapon arsenal, we've got Liquid Flame on our hands. This is a really interesting boss battle. The boss has three forms, each sharing the same HP total with their own abilities. The human form uses Blaze to hit everyone for 25% damage, the hand form attacks physically and counterattacks with Fyra, and the tornado form casts Fyra on itself to heal. It also randomly changes form every time you hit it with anything. However, there is a strategy to this fight. We need to get it into the tornado form quickly, then just wait a bit. While it will fully heal itself with Fyra, eventually it'll just run out of MP and no longer be able to heal. The tornado form doesn't attack, so this means we can fully heal with the healing staff whenever it shows up. I was a little worried about the hands fire a counterattack though, since that would take one party member out from full HP every time it was used. Or at least I was worried about it until the hand form ran out of MP as well. The fight's not over yet though, we need to make sure we finish this boss while it's in tornado form. It drops different items depending on what form it's in when it dies, and I need the one from the tornado form specifically. You can imagine the frustration when I accidentally killed it in the wrong form with 6 damage punches after fighting it for 15 minutes. Next attempt, I wised up and used a calculator to keep track of exactly how much damage I was doing, and finally finished it off in the right form to get the flame bow I wanted. As usual, we arrived just in time to watch the crystal explode. That's not the only thing that's exploding, though. We have 10 minutes to get out of the castle before it blows up, too. With a party this week, we can't get everything, and some of the chests are flat out useless to us, but we were able to get quite a few elixirs. I think I got exactly the number of chests I was capable of getting. When you go to leave, you're forced into a fight with the infamous time-wasting bounty hunter Deathclaw, which ate up more time than I expected. I escaped with only 15 seconds left on the clock. One more chest or unnecessary fight, and that would have been it. Sid has crippling depression because it's technically his fault the last three crystals exploded, so we gotta motivate him. Time to head to the Library of the Ancients. Once we get to the library, we run into an issue. One of the random encounters can cast level 5 death, and my whole party is at or close to level 15. I found this out the hard way, so I made sure to grind an extra level on my next attempt before heading back in. It didn't take long before we ran into the next boss, Ifri. Yes, this game does throw bosses at you constantly. And I love it for it. 
This fight was like Liquid Flame on steroids. He has the same blaze and fire attacks that Liquid Flame has, but he's not quite as pattern based. He can just use them whenever he wants. I had issues trying not to get overwhelmed until one thought led to another. I was swapping out weapons trying to get the best damage output I could until I tried the whip. Whips sometimes paralyze their targets, and Ifri is vulnerable to paralysis. He didn't stay paralyzed for long, but it gave me precious extra time to deal damage and heal up, letting us wrap this fight up in just two attempts. Once we beat Ifri, there's not much left that can stop us until we run into the real boss of the Library of Ancients, Byblos. This is a common roadblock, and for good reason. His strategy is surprisingly smart for a Final Fantasy boss, and he has two ways to take us down. First, the regular way. He dishes out good physical damage, and his Wind Slash hits our whole party for about three-fourths of their max HP. If he uses Wind Slash too often, we just die. There's a bit of RNG there already, but then we get to his second method, using buffs and debuffs to destroy your ability to fight him. Every time we hit him physically, he has a chance to cast Protect, cutting our physical damage against him in half for the rest of the fight. He can also use Web to have someone's speed, and Discord to have their level, which also cuts their damage output by about a third in addition to all the annoying ping noises. This is not a battle we can win by attrition. We have to kill him before he either kills everyone with Wind Slash or nerfs them all into uselessness. This is what we wanted that flame bow for. Byblos is weak against fire, so this is our most damaging attack option by far. Unfortunately, most bows only have 70% accuracy by default without the aim command, and our band of scrubs doesn't know what an aim command is. Basically, we have to hope that Byblos' AI does stupid things and that the flame bow's horrible accuracy doesn't cause problems. Most of my attempts either ended after one too many wind slashes or one too many debuffs. But eventually, I got the perfect attempt where I did a ton of damage before Protect went up while he wasted his turns uselessly damaging our MP with Magic Hammer. This is where I learned that Byblos is vulnerable to paralysis just like Ifri was. I was worried since he can counterattacks with Drain to recover HP when he's low, but he was paralyzed so long that I beat him down without ever seeing him use it. I was expecting this to be a much bigger roadblock, but the flame bow and especially paralysis status from the whip really pulled their weight here. I guess you learn something new every day, huh? We grab Mid, who was somehow completely oblivious to that entire battle, and bring him to cheer up Sid. Apparently, his idea of cheering up Sid is to punch him repeatedly. Wow, who knew that's all you need to do to cure depression? Just please don't try this at home. This makes Galu fondly remember those times his granddaughter beat him up for no reason. After receiving Mid's, uh, motivational technique, Sid fixes up the ship for us, so we've got some sailing around the world to do. There are some useful things we can grab. Not as many as we usually would, but we can still get some weaponry that might help us a lot. The Coral Sword deals lightning damage, the Blitz Whip is a better back row weapon, and the Mage Masher sometimes causes silence, so we can use it if we really want someone to shut up. There's actually an optional encounter calling my name in history. You can find Ramu around here as a random encounter, so I wanted to see if I could beat him. Thundara dishes out about 400 damage, and Lightning is another 25% damage attack, so he's got some pretty fearsome things in his arsenal. However, sometimes he'll waste turns with Osmos, weaker attacks, or just flashing the party instead of actually doing anything. So we won in just two attempts. Now we didn't get anything of use from this, but hey, I did win, and now we have the old man living in our pants pocket forever. Once we finally progress the plot and head to Crescent Isle, our ship immediately sinks. Now you see why I did all that ocean exploration earlier. It just so happens there's a black chocobo on this island, though, who was also carrying more jewelry. That'd look good on a bracelet once he cleaned the bird slobber off. Now that we have the black chocobo, we can visit our main character's hometown to hear his tragic backstory. This clearly excuses him from getting a job. Our actual next stop is the Desert of Shifting Sands, where we need just a little help from Sid and Mid to face our next boss, Sandworm. This fight really wasn't too bad. The quicksand does some damage, but it's not enough to stop us from wiping the floor with this worm. The desert afterwards was no trouble, so we easily make it to Gone, the ruined town. We find Lena's father trying to dodge his parental responsibilities, so we follow him only to fall into a trap. We get them teleporting underneath Crescent Isle, set in mid again to mischief, and we get ourselves an airship with our next boss clinging onto it, Crayclaw. It's weak against lightning damage though, so we can carve it up with the Coral Sword and take it down in record time. 
There is something we should do first before we forget, though. Fight a few encounters on the Crescent Isle until we get a Death Sickle. On top of looking really cool, this weapon has a chance to instantly kill the target, so we'll keep it in our back pocket for a rainy day, just in case we need cheese strats. After we deal with a short errand where we kill a wild turtle with ice arrows, we have a flying fortress to take down. Its first set of defenses aren't anything too terrible to deal with. Flame guns aren't anything to worry about. As soon as there's only one left, we can easily keep up with its damage with the healing staff. As for the rocket launchers, their only threatening attack is Rocket Punch due to its added Confuse status. We can easily take care of Confusion just by using the healing staff on the afflicted character, or in a pinch, unequipping our weapon and punching them back to their senses. Once we get past the initial wave of defenses, that just leaves the Soul Cannon, and this one is going to be a serious fight. First of all, it's got two launchers accompanying it, and these are threatening in a whole new way. They will fire missiles every time their turn comes around, and their missiles are guaranteed to inflict aging status. Aging is a terrible status effect for us since it drops our stats over time, rendering the affected character worthless for the rest of the fight. We rush down the launchers first, but they still manage to age everyone but Ferris before going down. The cannon itself is quite simple. It charges for several turns, then fires Wave Cannon, an attack that deals half of every character's max HP. With an attack like that, we're better off having one character solo this phase to cut down on the item usage, even if everyone else hadn't already been aged into uselessness. With this strategy, I was barely able to outlast the boss. It was uncomfortably close, and I did still have to use a high potion and every elixir in my stash, but I did manage to come out on top. That Coral Sword was definitely worth it. The Rock and Ruins were a bit tricky, but nothing we can't handle with a little healing staff abuse. We also find a very important piece of gear, the Ancient Sword. This lets us turn the tables and make our enemies ancient instead, so we'll be keeping that. We find Lena's father acting entirely normal, so we follow his orders to fight the next boss, Archeoavis. This one's an interesting boss with five forms that each have different attacks and elemental weaknesses. However, our standard hit it physically and swing the healing staff to stay alive strategy works pretty well against the first four forms. His last form introduces his most threatening attack, Maelstrom, which reduces everyone to single-digit HP. You can't really recover from that without burning some valuable healing items, so I came incredibly close to death against the final form. The final form also has the lowest defense though, so I was able to finish it off before it finished me off. Unfortunately, the party gets distracted by a family reunion just long enough for the last crystal to shatter, returning Exdeath, the world's corniest villain, to life. Lena's father gets killed by the evil crystal shard, so we take the evidence with us to avoid being framed for murder. Galuf leaves because his planet needs him, hopefully he doesn't die on the way back to his home planet, and we've got a few more boss fights in our way before we can follow him. The first one I went for was the Parobolos, a group of six monsters that explode and revive each other. I was worried this might be a huge roadblock, but actually you can just let them blow themselves up and take themselves out as long as you can weather the explosions. Titan is next. The only tricky part about his fight is surviving his final attack, but one character did manage to survive it with 30 HP to spare on the first try. The last one I needed to kill was Manticore, and this one took me by surprise. Frost and Aqua Breath deal enough damage to the party that it's actually tricky to stay alive. Clearly, I need a better strategy, and I found one after looking stuff up. This boss is vulnerable to aging. By inflicting the boss with aging, it gets way slower and eventually its physical attacks deal zero damage. I still had to deal with Frost and Aqua Breath though, and those aren't affected by aging at all. However, Aqua Breath costs a ton of MP. If I stall long enough with the Healing Staff, eventually it'll run out of MP and be unable to use anything except Frost and its harmless physical attacks. It took a while, but eventually I got that coveted not enough MP message and finished off the boss. There was definitely an easier way, but I can safely say that nobody has ever used that strategy before. By the way, I didn't forget about Shiva. She was really difficult when I was in Walls for the first time, but by this point in the game she's very easy. After a little elixir farming, we follow Galv to World 2 and get captured immediately, forcing a solo rescue mission from Galuf. With the healing staff though, nothing can really challenge us here, especially not Gilgamesh. It doesn't take long until he blocks our way again on the big bridge though, and this fight's a lot harder. Once you take down enough of his HP, he casts a bunch of buffs on himself and starts jumping like Super Mario. I got the idea to inflict him with aging, and it somehow worked, but it wasn't enough to save me from his jumps. 
On the next attempt, I inflicted him with aging first, and that was enough to keep me healthy enough to overcome his stupendous stops. Regal sells some really cool stuff for us. Chain whips are just better whips, and the sleep blade has a chance to, well, put enemies to sleep, which never wears off until you hit them again. We can also start buying high potions, giving us an actually useful method of healing that isn't elixirs or the aging healing staff. The next dungeon was fairly easy as a result, since we could put enemies to sleep with the sword and heal the full with the staff. The Tyrannosaur was another two-try boss. The first time, his counterattack murdered me since it deals damage equal to how much damage he's already taken. On the second attempt, I managed to get Aging Status to stick, and hit him exclusively with his elemental weakness to minimize his chances to counterattack. As soon as I got a proper strategy, he was boned. A bunch of plot stuff follows. Only important part is that we get the Dancing Dagger, an important item since it sometimes lets us dance while attacking for useful effects. We have to find some grass for a wounded Windrake, but first we have a little mini-boss fight. I thought it might be troublesome when he fully healed himself while murdering a party member twice in a row, but the third time was the charm and I got lucky enough to take him down. On the way to the next objective, I tried fighting the Gill Turtle, but it wasn't even a fight, it just instantly slaughtered me. Clearly, this thing is not to be messed with. In Quelb, Hikiko goes Super Saiyan and finds out his family tree was more complicated than he thought before we head into the next dungeon, Drakenvale. The fights take a long time, but they aren't too difficult. Once we get to the boss, though, I suffered a truly embarrassing defeat. I fought it for an actual hour, hoping I could claw my way out of a bad situation with the Dancing Dagger, but I just couldn't. I did memorize how the boss worked, though. From left to right, the small flowers inflict confusion, paralysis, blindness, poison, and aging. Most of these are bad news, but I can live with poison, so if I just kill the others whenever they show up, I can beat down the dragon pod very quickly. Once we get back, Lena. Uh, okay, seriously, you poisoned yourself again? Is this gonna become a running thing with you? At least the wind drake's fine, though, so we can go watch an island sink and join the navy. Guess who's waiting for us, though? Gilgamesh, of course, with faithful sidekick Enkidu. We can still make Gilgamesh too old to hurt us, but Enkidu worried me since he's got multiple healing abilities. With a little luck, though, I took down his 4000 HP and Gilgamesh fell shortly after. On to the next dungeon, the Barrier Tower. This one's a long climb, but the hardest thing is the trapped chests. These enemies are very deadly. I pushed through to kill one so I could get the Blood Sword, but it never hits anything. I think I got trolled. On top of the tower, we find the next boss, Atomos. He is a gimmick boss. He has permanent haste and two attack patterns. If nobody in the party is dead, he'll spam combat between zero and two times per turn until someone is dead. Once at least one party member is on the floor, he'll slowly vacuum them up and eventually remove them from the battle once they get too close. This fight was a race against time to beat him before we ran out of space. One thing that did help us a lot is that he's vulnerable to sleep status. Whenever the sleep blade lived up to its name, I had plenty of time to heal up and fish for good results from the dancing dagger. Eventually he threw a curveball at me by casting Sloga and slowing down my entire party. I've literally never seen him do that before. I ended up killing off my own characters and reviving them just to get rid of the slow status. It got really close after Lena got sucked in, but I managed to just barely snag a win out of this 20 minute long fight. That one was pretty thrilling. The tower goes Michael Bay, and we go through a short dungeon to talk to a turtle and get a tree branch. Before we progress with the plot, I felt like beating up Katoblapas. Its only real gimmick is that it counters with Demon Eye to petrify one party member every time you hit it. I used up all my gold needles, but I did manage to beat it. On to our next dungeon, the Forest of Moor. The gear in here is typically very useful, but most of it either isn't good for our purposes or breaks the rules. Looking at you, Aegis Shield. We failed to prevent a forest fire, but it doesn't change much on our way to the next fight, the Crystal Seals. Each crystal represents an element, as usual, and they all cause major problems. There's four of them, and four of them hitting us each turn is already a little tricky to deal with, but it's when their HP falls below 3000 that things get really bad. Each of them has a specific elemental attack, and they all wreck us badly. Even Aqua Breath just destroys our entire party, not to mention the other three crystals still beating on us. My only options were to go grind like 10 levels, or try a cheese strat I'd heard about before. It turns out these crystals are vulnerable to instant death. So there's no better time than now to finally break out the Death Sickle. 
I actually had to heal the last one to make sure it wouldn't start destroying me with elemental magic, but I managed to win the fight that way. Afterwards, Gallo's daughter Kryl gets trapped by a burning ring of fire, and we're faced with one of the best battle-based set pieces in the entire Final Fantasy series. Compared to the way people roll their eyes at forced loss fights in RPGs, it's amazing how much more effective a forced win fight really is. In fact, it's so effective that after the fight, the party tries to save Galuf by casting spells they don't even know to try to bring him back. Sadly, it doesn't work. Maybe they should have tried that on Aerith instead. Thankfully, Kral's here to become the new Galuf, gaining all zero of the abilities he learned along the way. It's finally time to take the fight directly to Exdeath's doorstep. This is actually a pretty tough dungeon due to the lava floors that constantly drain your HP with every step. When we can't avoid the damage and can't heal the damage with anything but potions, those lava floors are costly. We do find a very useful weapon in the form of the Hayate Bow, though. We also beat up Carbuncle along the way for no reason, paralyzing it and whittling it down fairly easily. The rest of the climb goes relatively smoothly, leading us up to Gilgamesh. This time, he's finally learned from his mistakes. Not only is he immune to aging, he actually uses it against us alongside a plethora of other status ailments. Long as he doesn't cast Time Slip too often, eventually we get him to transform, and the fight's basically over after that. X-Death banishes everyone's favorite swordsman, and all we get for it is the world's worst sword. How sad. Speaking of X-Death, he's right up the stairs from Gilgamesh. We have no idea what he's actually trying to do, but that won't stop us from getting revenge. This was a fight I was dreading for a long time, and he proved me right quickly. First of all, he's faster than our party, so he can sometimes get double turns on us. His first phase is entirely pattern-based, and he's got a variety of fearsome moves in here. Doom to kill one party member in 30 seconds, harsh multi-target attacks like Earthshaker and Zombie Breath, that kind of thing. He's got great defense and 32,768 HP, too, so we have to endure at least a few cycles of this at best. You might be wondering how we're going to take down that much HP by whipping him for 300 damage. Well, that's where the Hayate Bow comes in. Every time you fire the Hayate Bow, it has a 25% chance of triggering Rapid Fire to hit X-Death four times for half damage while ignoring defense. Even with this, and a few dud moves like level 3 Flare wasting X-Death's turns, we still have to stay on our toes. His second phase is where it gets really bad. He stops following a pattern, and stops using Doom and his multi-target attacks, but he also drops all his dud moves as well. During this phase, he can use regular attacks, strong attacks, or strong magic whenever he wants, alongside sometimes attacking twice per turn whenever he wants. Basically, we can't handle this fight yet without a lot of luck. The issue is that we don't have enough good healing, damage, or health, and there aren't any better tactics we can use. It's not like we could make X-Death old or something, he's immune to basically every status ailment. Our only solution left is to grind. Over in the Moor area, the enemies give plenty of EXP while not being too lethal to fight, and sometimes we can find Cure Beasts that occasionally drop elixirs. I got a bunch more elixirs and a bunch of levels, leaving the whole party at level 37. Now we finally have the necessary strength to weather X-Death's horrible random second phase and disintegrate him. Even after our grinding, this was still a grueling 30-minute battle of attrition. I actually ended up doing this fight twice. The first time, I used literally every healing item I had, leaving me in very bad shape. But, luckily, I lost some footage, forcing me to redo the X-Death fight, and I managed to get through it with some healing items left. I knew this would be a roadblock, but I didn't realize how much of a difficulty spike it would be. After beating X-Death, we end up in front of Castle Tycoon, and World 3 starts slowly with social awkwardness at a party, leaving Hikiko and Kryl to go venture off on their own. They do have to fight an antlion, but it's barely even a footnote on the journey while Ferris rejoins afterwards. Lena fails to avoid the void, X-Death is revealed as a closet speciesist, Guido makes one too many bad jokes, and we learn about our next objective, get stone tablets to unlock the 12 legendary weapons, and kill X-Death to death. To that end, we head towards the pyramid, but this is where I made a mistake. I believe there's a place to stock up on high potions at this point in World 3, but I didn't know about it, so I was very low on supplies the whole time. The pyramid isn't an easy dungeon, either. It starts with a fight against two gargoyles, who must be killed simultaneously. 
Not too hard, but not trivial either. The enemies inside aren't exactly easy, and there's plenty of traps with a few forced encounters along the way. These enemies aren't easy to get away from either. In particular, this Zephyrus enemy is so hard to escape from that you're better off just sticking around and fighting because it takes literal minutes of holding L and R to actually get away. I ended up breaking out the old Sleep Blade and Healing Staff strategies to stay healthy, and even threw elixirs at a couple of tough undead foes who I couldn't hit with Phoenix Downs. When used on undead enemies, their HP will drop to single digits. There's no boss in the pyramid itself, but taking it on with only three party members and limited items proved pretty challenging. On the way back, we get attacked by an evil Psycho Lena who was angry we let her get vacuumed up by the Void. Oh, wait a minute, she was just possessed by Melazine. Melazine isn't too tricky of a boss. She slings around plenty of elemental magic and her defense is very high, but we can stunlock her with sleep status and bypass her defense with the Hayate Boast Rapid Fire for a relatively easy win. Now we finally have a full party again, and we've got a tablet to turn in. When we turn in these tablets, we can pick three legendary weapons out of the twelve to take with us for each one. This time, I took the Masamune, Yoichi's Bow, and Fire Lash. On top of being top tier back row weapons, the Yoichi's Bow has a 30% chance to crit, and the Fire Lash sometimes toasts enemies with Firaga. So these choices make sense, but why take the Masamune? It's not for its attack power, but for its effects. First of all, if you have it equipped, you'll always take the first turn in battle, no matter what your speed is. And secondly, if you use it as an item in battle, it casts Haste. Haste is the best buff in the game, so this does wonders for our combat abilities. Yes, this is a first level time magic spell that we're just now getting access to in World 3. This challenge really makes you appreciate the little things, doesn't it? The next tablet dungeon we tackle is the Island Shrine. Each tablet dungeon is guarded by more gargoyles, but they're not worth talking about now that we have even stronger weapons to put them down with. The Island Shrine doesn't have too much to talk about. We can find the Rising Sun and Beast Killer in chests, which are more macro weapons to fill out our repertoire, but the enemies and puzzles aren't anything too dangerous. The boss fight couldn't pose too much of a threat either. Stalker has a unique gimmick, where there are four of him in battle but only one can actually take damage. But once we had the speed advantage with haste, he couldn't keep up. Before heading to the next area, I did grab the Chicken Knife. This weapon gets stronger every time you run from battle, so it might be quite useful later. However, I had a potential roadblock in my way in the Fork Tower. The Fork Tower's gimmick is that you send a team up both towers, and both have opposite rules. In one tower, no magic abilities work and everything must be done physically, and the other is meant for magic users and heavily discourages physical attacks with deadly magic counterattacks. The physical side isn't a problem since we can't use any magic anyway, but I was scared of the magic side. We do find a couple of really useful tools along the way. The Defender Sword casts Protect when used in battle, letting us cut incoming physical damage in half, and the Wonder Wand lets us cast spells from a rotating list when we swing it. After fighting my way up the physical side and running for my life up the magical one, we get to the bosses of the Fork Tower. Minotaur is the physical side's boss, and all he does is hit us, so the Masamune and Defender are more than enough to let us run circles around him and beat him down. Even the ending of his fight is a joke, where he tries to cast Holy but doesn't have enough MP. The next boss, however, is no joke. Omniscient is the magical side's boss, and he enforces that harshly. Not only does he spend all his time slinging magic around, but if you hit him with anything that isn't magic in return, he'll cast Return to reset the battle to the beginning. I had no idea how I was going to win this, but that didn't stop me from giving it a few attempts. It turns out he's even more restrictive than I thought. If you swing the Wonder Wand to cast a spell towards him, he counts it as a physical attack and resets the battle anyway. So waving a wand isn't real spell casting. I bet the Harry Potter fans won't be happy to hear that. Even if the spell in question misses, he still resets the fight anyway. So what are we going to do? I messed with the idea of using the Mage Masher to silence him, but that's only a 33% chance with each attack, and I can't use Reflect to attack myself and bounce it back at Omniscient for long. During my experimentation, though, I ended up stumbling upon a possible solution. 
I got Reflect onto Hikiko and wanted to see if bouncing spells off of Reflect wouldn't trigger Omniscient's counterattack. But the spell immediately after Reflect in the Wonder Wand's rotation is Berserk. That not only shuts down his spell casting, but also shuts down his ability to reset the fight. The bad news is that his attack power is absolutely insane. Even in the back row with Protect, he deals about 800 damage per hit. I didn't think I could deal with this until I found out something I never would have expected. Omniscient is vulnerable to paralysis. I have no idea why he's vulnerable to this, since you cannot inflict it normally without provoking his counterattack, but it did help a lot to cut down on the number of hits I was taking. With the help of paralysis and a few elixirs, I survived and took him down. We can't actually use either of the spells we get from the Fork Tower, but I think we got enough useful gear to make it worth it, alongside submarine access. Speaking of useful gear, the Phantom Village has a Thief Knife, which occasionally lets us steal while attacking, and a Black Chocobo hidden within. We also head up to the top of Istri Falls to grab the hidden Magic Lamp, an item which we will desperately need in the future since it gives us limited access to summon magic. The Sunken Walls Tower was pretty easy since the actual intended method to defeat the boss at the bottom is to do absolutely nothing. I also went to grab three more legendary weapons. I don't have much use for the rest of them, but I might as well round out my collection, right? Speaking of legendary weapons, we've still got to go do Istri Falls. The enemies here aren't very threatening, with the exception of Tonberries, but we can just run from those. We find quite a bit of treasure here, some of it useless like this Rune Blade, some of it being useful stuff we just can't use like this Reflect Ring, and then there's the Artemis Bow. This thing has an attack power of 111, even higher than the Yoichi Bow's 101, and though it doesn't have the Yoichi Bow's 30% crit chance, it does crit 100% of the time against Magic Beast enemies. This might come in really handy. The rest of the dungeon is just a few spike traps and stairs until we grab the tablet and Leviathan shows up to annihilate the Hitman next death sent after the party. You don't actually have to fight Leviathan, you can just walk out of the dungeon and skip him entirely. But that's no fun, so of course I went to fight him. This turned out to be a much more interesting fight than I was expecting. Normally, Leviathan is a total non-issue because you can fry him instantly with lightning damage and a coral ring turns his tidal waves into healing. We have neither of these, so this turned into a surprisingly tricky fight. On my first attempt, he annihilated me very quickly with tidal waves, dealing 800 damage to the entire party per hit. That's rough but survivable, especially if I stay on my toes and keep up with healing. That worked, but Leviathan sometimes takes two actions per turn, and eventually he rolled double tidal waves in a single round of combat. That's 1,600 damage to every member of the party, more than anyone's max HP. Thankfully, I already had the solution to this problem in my inventory. In the Wonder Wand's fixed list of spells it cycles through, Shell is one of the options, and we can prepare it ahead of time since it keeps its spot between battles. Tidal Wave is a magical attack, so this would cut the damage it deals in half for the affected character, making Tidal Wave a relative non-issue and double Tidal Wave survivable. I can only apply this to one person before the wand moves on to the next spell, but it turned out to be a good idea. His physicals and counterattacks were still hurting me pretty badly, though, especially his entangle counterattack that paralyzes the target. This is when I decided to look something up and discovered a hilarious weakness Leviathan has. He can be blinded. I have never actually blinded anything in the game up to this point, but if it sticks, it drops the enemy's attack accuracy to 25%. With that strategy, his physicals went from a drain on my resources to free turns three-fourths of the time. That turned out to be the edge I needed. He could still throw out double tidal waves, but he couldn't actually take me down before I took him down. When I used the tablet from this dungeon, I made sure to grab the Sage's Staff. This one is special since it deals 8 times damage against undead and casts rays when used as an item. This was the perfect item to tackle the Great Sea Trench, where every enemy was undead. Unfortunately, the enemies are not the main problem in the Great Sea Trench. Remember the lava floors in Xdeath's castle? Now imagine that, except they're everywhere. I was chugging a lot of healing items to deal with the constant floor damage. I didn't have too many resources left by the time I got to the boss, so I took the cheap strategy of killing one of them with revival, and killing the other two by reducing their HP to single digits with elixirs before finishing them off. 
we claim our great reward of a spell we can't use, grab the last three legendary weapons that likely won't see much use, and move on. I set my sights on Odin next. The gimmick for this fight is that you only have one minute to beat him. That's not a lot of time, especially for how terrible we are at dealing damage. We're gonna need optimization, not just for damage output, but for time. The magic lamp summons do plenty of damage, but they can take up to 10 seconds each, and that's not time we have to spare. Instead, let's prepare the Wonder Wand in advance. Odin is weak against lightning damage from Thundaga, so it should work well, and Flare is the spell right after Thundaga, which deals even more damage. Then we need to be using the Masamune from the front row and hoping for critical hits, using the Yoichibo and hoping for critical hits, and using our strongest weapons for everyone else for a little extra damage output. We can win this way, but everything has to go right. We have to get as many critical hits as possible, and Odin has to get low damage rolls with Zantetsuken and not kill anyone off with his regular attack. There is a cheese strat to kill him instantly by summoning Katoblapas, but it's not very reliable. We have to make sure we have plenty of time left, too, because if the timer runs out while he's still in the process of dying, we still lose. This took dozens of attempts, but eventually the stars aligned and Odin died with five seconds left on the clock. That was intense. Bahamut is our next target, waiting on North Mountain for us. This version of Bahamut is a lot harder than you'd expect. Normally he's a very pattern-based fight where he relies entirely on his signature move Mega Flare and gives you a countdown beforehand to prepare for it. In this game, however, he can just use it with no warning whatsoever, and that's not even his only attack that can wipe our entire party. I did what I could, but pure luck only got us so far. I even went and confused a Gaelicat enemy to make it cast Float on the party, letting me dodge Earthshaker, but that didn't help much. However, Bahamut's pattern and the moves he uses depend on his current HP, with his moveset changing every 5000 HP he loses. With a little caution and a little mercy from Bahamut, we can make it through the fight without letting any of the really dangerous attacks touch us. That just leaves the Phoenix Tower for optional World 3 content. While we can normally just run from random encounters, this place is a 30-floor endurance test where you cannot escape from a single encounter. It's tough getting up to the top, and tough to watch the cutscene that plays at the top, but the real hard part is getting back down. Even in World 3, though, the healing staff is still our best friend. By abusing the optional magic pot encounters, and using haste and protect to augment our stall capabilities, we can survive the trip back down. I gotta say, I did not expect the healing staff to still be useful this late into the game. All that's left is the interdimensional rift, the final dungeon of the game. This place is filled with a ton of bosses, so I'm mostly going to be talking about those. Let's start with Califisteri. It seems at first like she could be a genuine issue, since she counters attacks with Drain and can also cast Old to take away our stats. At least until we get our buffs up and take a shot with the Artemis Bow. Califisteri is a magic beast enemy, so it dishes out, oh, over 2,000 damage per hit. Needless to say, she went down pretty quickly. The two super bosses of the game are also in the void, but I'm not going to bother with them. If you want to know why, here's Omega, generally considered the easier of the two super bosses. Not only can he wipe our entire party almost instantly, but he also can't be hurt by anything unless we use rapid fire from the Hayate Bow. It might be possible, but you would need some ridiculous Hayate Bow RNG, let's put it that way. Speaking of the Hayate Bow, we're gonna be replacing it soon. It turns out if we head back to the Island Shrine, we can use the Thief Knife against the Todd Avis enemies and steal the Avis Killer, a much better bow. After that little detour, it's time to head back into the void and face our next boss, a panda. Sadly, he is not a panda. He is just a Byblos clone with higher stats. And he is also a magic beast, so we can murder him with the Artemis bow fairly easily. The chicken knife has a 25% chance of forcing you to instantly escape from battle, which is actually a good thing, and helped a lot to get us up to the Dimensional Castle relatively unscathed. Our next boss is Azul Mahia. His name is just Blue Magic in Spanish, so you might be able to figure out what he does. I got super lucky against him, though. He has a lot of abilities we really don't want to see him use, and he barely used any of them. I was really worried that he'd cast Mighty Guard and outheal my damage output with White Wind, but that never happened, so he fell apart pretty quickly, leaving behind a very important save point. It's very important because our next boss comes literally immediately afterwards. Catastrophe, who is a very simple boss. 
he only has one dangerous move, Earthshaker. However, that is the only dangerous move he needs because it does way more damage than we can possibly keep up with without chugging elixirs. Against all odds, we can make him old with the Ancient Sword, but I never survived long enough to really make it matter. Clearly, we need to work on our strategy. If we head all the way back to North Mountain, we can get float status from confused Gaela cat enemies, and that might help us just a little bit. Of course, that also means we have to walk all the way back to this point in the void without using a cottage or having anyone die. Did you know this pot also removes float status for some reason? Now you do. I learned the hard way. On the way back, I also somehow managed to steal a second Artemis bow from a Dragon Avis. The odds of this happening are ridiculously low, but I will gladly take it. Once we make it back, Catastrophe counters this strategy by using 100 Gs to cancel float status. However, it turns out that one extra turn and a little luck was all I needed to win this fight. I stalled until his stats aged away into nothing, leaving his Earthshaker damage low enough to heal through with high potions, and he went down afterwards. I've never had to go that far to beat Catastrophe before, that guy's normally a footnote at best. Helicarnassus is our next boss, but he doesn't really do much. He has a couple of mildly annoying moves, but he generally just stands there and lets you beat on him until he dies. I almost feel kinda bad for the guy. On the roof of the castle, Twin Tanya awaits us, and this will be a much more interesting fight. In its normal form, it counters any physical attack with Tidal Wave, which might be a bit tricky to survive. It becomes vulnerable while it's charging for Giga Flare, but Giga Flare itself deals about 3,000 damage to the entire party. However, its damage is affected by Shell, and that turned out to be the winning ticket for the entire fight. Outside of Giga Flare, Twintania's damage output is surprisingly low against one character protected by both Protect and Shell. In fact, it's low enough that with the help of Haste, we can fully recover with the healing staff before Giga Flare pops up again. We even have enough time to get a critical shot with the Artemis Bow every time it powers up for Giga Flare. It takes a little time, but there is no risk of death with this strategy, so eventually Twintania gave up. I know there is an easier cheese strat to use against this boss, but I felt proud to come up with this strategy. Now, we finally made it into the final void area. You can tell because it's made of crystals. We do have a nice chat with Gilgamesh, but not much else happens on our way to the next boss, Necrophobia. This one's looking pretty dire. He's invincible while his barriers are still alive, and they spend all their time bouncing strong magic at the party off of Reflect. They wreak havoc on our party very quickly because of this. We can't even kill the barriers quickly to make up for it since they have almost 9,000 HP. So, how are we gonna get past this? Even spamming the magic lamp doesn't give us quite the damage output we need before the barriers lay waste to our whole party. Instead, let's focus on weakening them immediately. They can be instantly killed by death and petrify attacks, and it just so happens we have two ways to abuse that. First, we can use the magic lamp to summon Carbuncle to give everyone reflect status. Then we can use it again to summon Katoblapas to use Demon's Eye and immediately petrify one of the barriers. Then we can use the Wonder Rod to bounce death or break off the party's reflect towards one of the barriers, bypassing their permanent reflect status. In practice, this didn't work as I'd hoped, because the reflected death always aimed for necrophobia and did absolutely nothing, but this was enough to survive and slowly take down the barriers over time. We also had to dish out enough damage to kill another barrier as fast as possible, and for that, we can move up to the front row and swing the full-powered chicken knife. The barriers never use physical attacks, so there's no reason not to be in the front row. Once his barriers are gone, the fight is practically over. We have to fight Necrophobia himself, but as long as we're careful and have plenty of high potions, we can't really lose this one. He's weak against every element, so the Fire Lash and Excalibur do great work here. It doesn't take too long before Gilgamesh shows up and bails us out. With that, we've reached the game's final save point. Nothing left but the final battle with X-Death. After all this time, we're finally here. And now the only question left is, how difficult could this fight possibly be? Let's get to it. Tree X-Death actually isn't that bad. He has a few particularly dangerous moves, namely casting Holy and Flare to instantly wipe one character, and White Hole which instantly kills and petrifies one character at the same time, somehow. But his most dangerous attack, Meteor, doesn't come out until he's below 10,000 HP. 
To be fair, it's a pretty harsh attack. It hits random targets four times, and it's almost guaranteed to wipe out any party member it hits. You'd have to be incredibly unlucky to have all four party members killed by it at once, but it'll leave your party in very bad shape, and there's nothing stopping him from casting it again. We just have to hope he doesn't cast it too often. Once we take down Triax Death, he's defeated. Nope, he just gets engulfed by the Void instead. What, you thought we'd have a Final Fantasy game where the final boss only has one phase? Nope, here comes the real threat, Neo X Death. This is where things get complicated fast. I'll try to explain. This boss has four separate parts, each of which have their own HP and attacks. First, we have the Delta Attack part on the far left. This one uses Delta Attack and high-level black magic, but it's nothing to worry about because summoning Odin from the Magic Lamp can instantly kill this part, and there's no reason not to. Then there's the Grand Cross part over in the middle, which uses... Grand Cross. This is a very dangerous attack that applies a random status ailment to every party member. It's entirely possible that this can wipe out your entire party if you're unlucky, or otherwise leave you unable to finish the battle. The Almageast part is at the bottom and only uses Almageast, a 1600 damage holy elemental magic attack that hits the whole party. This is worse than it sounds because we have to be at full health to survive that much damage at once, and we have to spend a ton of healing items to get back to safe HP values. Shell won't help either since the physical part at the right exclusively uses physical attacks and Dispel to get rid of buffs. We're gonna need a coherent strategy to have any chance of winning this. First things first, we want everyone in good health before we finish chopping down Triax Death, and then immediately summon Odin with the Magic Lamp to chop down the Delta Attack part. Now we have to figure out which part to prioritize. We can leave the physical part alive since it just hits us and casts Dispel, and we can blind it to leave it completely helpless. That just leaves the Grand Cross and Almageast parts. Should we prioritize getting rid of the constant high damage attacks, or the super random attack that could instantly kill the entire party at any moment? I went for the Grand Cross part first, since I wanted to eliminate some of the randomness from this fight. Each of these parts has about 50,000 HP each, so this isn't a fast process, but we can slowly whittle it down. And now we reach a new problem. If we kill all but one part of Neo X Death, the final part will go into a frenzy and begin a new attack pattern. One where it moves twice per turn and gains a new moveset, including Vacuum Wave, Almageast, and Meteor. I don't want to deal with an onslaught like that, so we have to slowly lower each part's HP until we can kill them at roughly the same time, never giving the last living part a turn. I broke out two calculators and went to work, pausing every time I dealt any damage to keep track. I dropped the Almageast part's HP very low in a short time since it was also a magic beast enemy and got slaughtered by the Artemis bow, so I just had to take down the physical part while surviving Almageast. At this point though, we've had a bit too much to drink. We've already used over 90 high potions and are basically out, and even the elixir supply is starting to run low. Drastic measures were necessary. I only need one character to survive Almageast and revive the rest, so I just healed one character and left the rest at low HP to be wiped out. I might have made a little mathematical oopsie, so I panicked when I heard the physical part suddenly die. Thankfully, I did my math just well enough to finish off the Almageast part as well before giving it a single turn. It took a few attempts and a little elixir farming, but we did finally manage to win this grueling hour-long fight. That is the hardest time I've ever had with Neo X Death, but it feels amazing to beat him with such strict handicaps. Anyway, because we treated the Crystal Shards so well by never using them, they reformed the Crystals. Everyone returns home safely, we fondly remember that time Hikiko murdered a guy, and Lena got poisoned and then got poisoned again, magic flowers appear, and... Credits roll, this challenge is officially complete! This one took a while, and I was pleasantly surprised by how this challenge turned out. It's not the most difficult thing to do in this game, but I wanted a Final Fantasy V challenge that would present some unique problems and strategies, and I think I got exactly what I was looking for. My favorite parts were probably the variety of unique strategies I used to get through the Dimensional Rift. Never before did I think I'd be pulling out the healing staff in the final dungeon, that's for sure. That thing was seriously one of the MVPs of the whole run. By the way, their credits are supposed to show off your final character stats and scroll through a list of your learned abilities, but because we never got a job or learned any abilities, the game instead awkwardly sits there showing off all zero abilities we acquired. Anyway, hopefully you guys enjoyed. 
whip the like button if you enjoyed this one, or shoot an arrow at the subscribe button if you'd like to see more weird challenges like this one. There's also Twitch and Discord links in the description if you want to see more of me. As for the future, well, you'll just have to wonder, won't you? I bet it'll be a pretty novel one for this channel. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time on the Reptile Rumble.